Yeah, so the Trist is is a comic about a man who is a high powered drug dealer or drug kingpin, basically. Who uh, the, the short version is he uh, dies and comes back to life with all of the powers of Jesus Christ. So he he, but it's all edgy. So he like turns the lemonade, the little girl's lemonade uh, uh, stand, into champagne. And he let's zoom out a little bit. Let's take a good look at this guy. He, he turns one gun into a bunch of guns. He brings a kid back from the dead who gets shot in a drive-by shooting. Um, and Rex says, oh, I remember you showing this before. Yeah. Um, so, so anyway, one of the really interesting things about this comic, though, is how little information there is about it. I, I looked to try to find more information about it. It doesn't seem like there was ever an issue, too. Uh, and... Uh, and Ringo says, I remember when Jesus had an army of guns in the Bible. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, and Rogi Francis says, "Wow, well, this is an extreme teen Bible." Um, yeah, there's there's like no information about this. The the comic publisher, Kinetic Comics, made some comics for the game Killer Seven, but that seems to be the only other thing that they did. Um, and if you look up, if you Google it or Bing it or whatever, if you, if you're a hipster and you use Google, or if you're a regular person and you use Bing, all you get are like Reddit threads of like people being like, "What the hell is this comic book?" But so anyway, so I was looking at this. I took a closer look, and on the inside cover, I saw the uh, people who worked on this. Because I was just looking at it again recently, and I noticed and thought it was funny that the writer and creator is this guy named A.J. Gentile. Because it's funny that your name is Gentile if you write a book about the man getting all the Jesus powers, okay? Um, and I, I tried to look into it, but A.J. Gentile, unfortunately is also the name of a voice actor who was in the Avatar show, so it actually just makes it even harder to try to figure out who is this guy who came up with the idea of the drug dealer who gets all the Jesus Christ superpowers, okay? But I kept looking, and I kept digging, and I found out there's this comic book that was came out 10 years later. So the Trist was in 2005, all right? And in 2015 or so, uh, I found out that somebody else, also named AJ Gentile, wrote a a, a series of comics that were compiled together into a, a, a paperback called, you know, a trade paperback called Humbug. He's, there's Gentile right there. And it, it turns out it's, it's AJ Gentile. But I was like, you know, this is like, I know this is not a totally uncommon name because there's this other guy who also has that name. And like, there's a whole 10 years apart. Like, how can I be sure that these are the same guy? And then I read the synopsis of Humbug, which is basically... What if Ebenezer Scrooge and Bob Cratchit and Ebenezer's, you know, nephew Fred and some other characters from A Christmas Carol, what if after A Christmas Carol they became the Ghostbusters? And I said, oh, no, it's the same guy. This is the same mind that conceived of the Trist 110%. Rangwat says, remember when Gave Theory gave the Pope Undertale? Someone needs to do that with this. Progy Friendly says, but why did you search for an important presentation? I just, I didn't want to show my file system uh, that was up here. And Ringo says, oh, I see. I thought it meant Gentile is Gentile, not a name, lol. And Rock says, that's a great concept for a comic, TBH. I thought so, too. I thought it was kind of funny, which is why I picked up a copy. Uh, there it is. And I read it. I read Humbug. It's, it's, so they made five issues and then compiled them together here in, in kind of one complete arc. And uh, I got—I wanted to bring up Humbug. I want to just do a little book report on one really particular aspect of Humbug that I got a big problem with. So, 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 if you read Ringwood's says Humbug channel, add it to the Discord for Humbug. It's too long. I can't scan it all in like we did with the Trist in Discord. Um, but anyway, so, so a problem that you see a lot with independent comics, among other things... Uh, is just, I, I don't know if it's something with the medium of comics that's difficult or whatever, but a lot of times it's hard to tell, like, when things happen. Like, we'll move from scene to scene, and it can be hard to convey, I think, in a comic book, how much time has passed, or, like, what order things are happening in, because they switch around from different characters' perspectives a lot and stuff. Does the Trist make a cameo? No, unfortunately. Um, the, Humbug has that problem, and I, I want to walk you through it a little bit. Uh, so I'm reading Humbug, my god. And at the end of the first issue, so they go to an opera house and they fight a ghost and the ghost leaves behind this chain link, okay? And you, you know, we know A Christmas Carol. So if there's a ghost and a chain link, we all know what that means. But the characters in this are like, what, what, what do it mean? There's a chain link. We don't know. And like, it's dumb. 
But I'm willing to suspend my disbelief and be like, well, you know, maybe it's been years since A Christmas Carol originally took place. And so they don't they, they don't make that connection there. And Ringo says, you know, Scrooge turning around to hunt the ghost he meets as a business feels like the opposite of him learning, lol. Yeah. So, so remember this, though. So this is at the end of the first issue. They find this chain link. And Brogy says, Trice is going to drain the wine from your bread, if you know what he means. Oh, no. <laughs> um, that, is, that is accurate, though. That is the kind of line that would be in it. Uh, but so anyway, so, so the second issue opens, and it's, it takes place at the beginning of, or sorry, at the end of the story, A Christmas Carol, right? It says, Christmas morn, 1848. I didn't take a picture of it here, but it's, it's you know, Scrooge goes out, he leans out the window, and he gets the kid to buy him the, go- the, the goose and stuff. He's a changed man after seeing the three ghosts, whatever. And then there's this page where, this is a really bad scan, uh, he, he meets a fourth ghost? And he's like, a fourth, you can't read this, but he's like, a fourth ghost? I thought there were going to be three ghosts. And there's this really confusing scene. The ghost doesn't say anything to him, but he's just like, yes, I understand. And we're basically, what we take this to mean is that this ghost has somehow, I guess, uh, in, uh, without words, conveyed to him that he needs to become a Ghostbuster. And so that's what he does. And Rango says, wait, oh, it takes place after Christmas Carol. I see. Well, that's kind of an interesting question. Because the next scene, right, takes us to Scrooge. He's at a bar. He's drinking. You, it, it didn't take a picture here, but he's, like, giving, buying everybody drinks, giving away pound coins. And so I assumed, because this is literally the next page after this, I was like, okay, so that's the night after the morning that a Christmas Carol takes place, right? Arrakis says, Scrooge is way younger than I expected. Is this the same artist as Trist? It's definitely, it's not the same artist, but we think it's the same writer. Uh, and it's actually also interesting that you should say that Scrooge is younger. Oh, that's interesting. We'll see if we can come back to that. Because uh, that's actually going to be important too, if you'll believe it. Uh, so I assumed this is like, this is the morning. He's a changed man. That night he goes out and parties and he's really generous, whatever, because it's Christmas, right? That makes sense. But then there's a scene that there's some other stuff that happens that's kind of unrelated. We're going to skip ahead a little bit. Basically, and ring with us, we both saw that lol. Basically, what happens is uh, he goes to bed. He wakes up late the next day. His maid brings him some dinner and she like pulls the lid off the tray. And it's, the, it's not his dinner. It's a little bat monster, whatever. Okay. So he and his nephew, Fred, who you might remember from A Christmas Carol, catch the ghost thing. In, I should have taken more pictures in this little dumb waiter and they open it up and it's gone. All right. It's gone. And there's a chain link in its place. And then Scrooge said something that blew my mind because he says a second link, nephew, to match the one from the opera house. Now, this infuriated me because this would seem to imply that the ghost busting thing at the opera house would have happened before he saw the three ghosts of a Christmas carol. But then was he fighting ghosts before? What does this mean? So I flipped back through the book, and, and I found on the very first page of the first issue, remember this is in the second issue, it says it takes place in London's West End, 1888. Okay? And I said, well, that, that number, that sounds familiar, 1888. Uh, but I remembered, looking back again, that it says Christmas morn, 1848. And I said, so have 40 years passed? So I guess there's a time jump between this Christmas morning and then this, this scene where he's in, in the bar. That's not actually on Christmas 1848. This is 40 years later. But look at him. Does he look 40 years older to, to you? And so I was very furious at this point reading the book. And I just decided to put it out of my head. I said, this has got to be a typo. This must supposed to also say 1848, or it says a few years later or something. They obviously just didn't really think about the time. Ringlet says, what the hell, Lamau? It gets worse, okay? So there's a scene later with Tiny Tim, and Tiny Tim looks like he's, like, a young man. He's, you can't really see him very well in this picture, but he looks like he's, like, 16 or 17 years old. And Arrakis says, I'm so excited to find out Scrooge is a Time Lord. And Pierogi Friend says, I'm shocked and disappointed by this sloppy continuity. Well, so I said, okay, so if he was Tiny Tim in A Christmas Carol, and now he's like 17 maybe, maybe like 10 years have passed. So maybe this is supposed to be 1858 or something like that. Whatever. But then this is, there's this conversation that happens between Bob Cratchit and his son, Tiny Tim, where they're talking about Scrooge has a broken stopwatch that he carries with him, okay? And... 
that there's this conversation. It's kind of dumb, but he says, Bob Cratchit says to his son, I confess he does look good for his age. And Tiny Tim says, and what precise age is that? And Bob Cratchit says, what I say to you now, son, does not venture outside the house of humbug. Oh, they're called the humbuggers. When they're the ghostbusters, they call themselves the humbuggers. That's excellent. I have no notes for that. Um, it does not venture outside the house of humbug. To be precise, Ebenezer Scrooge has lived a full century and a year. Oh, I stand corrected. A hundred and two. Lest we forget, his birthday was yesterday. That's kind of faded out. You can't read it. Um, so Scrooge is a hundred and two years old. And this, you might be wondering, why is Scrooge a hundred and two years old? And there's an explanation on the next page. He goes into detail. Um, but you tell me if this makes any sense to you. Ringlet says, 40 years later actually makes sense now, though, because technically that means he finds the link after the first one. Yes, that's correct. So he does find the second link after the first one. All those things are 40 years later. He says, you see, on the night of the visitation, Scrooge was certain the specters were intent to take his life. In an attempt to leave evidence of the crime, Ebenezer shattered his pocket watch so those who discovered his body would know the exact moment of his murder. When he shattered that watch, he was in the presence of the ghost of Christmas past. He shattered time when he was brought back 25 years. Ebenezer hasn't aged a day since. Not only has, was he redeemed that fated night, he was given the greatest Christmas gift of all. And the next, the next box says time. All right, but... Rangwood says, 40 years, uh, uh, Giant Spider says, why is Bob Cratchit Daniel Craig? Oh, that Daniel Craig is actually Ebenezer Scrooge. Um, but okay, so, so hold on. So this means some important things. First of all, our tiny Tim is gotta be like in his 40s. And Fred, the nephew, who is like, what, 19 or something tops in the book? He's gotta be like 59. Bob Cratchit's probably in his 70s. And Scrooge lives forever because... He was holding a watch, and it, he broke it, and a watch is a time thing, and the ghost of Christmas past is a time thing, and so now he lives forever, and that's all you get. Okay, why is Scrooge Daniel Craig? No, no reason. I actually think the back of the book, I, I didn't, uh, let me go to the big camera real quick. They actually mention him looking like Daniel Craig. It's funny you should bring that up. Um, they say, uh, Daniel Craig is mentioned. There, so you're not the only one. Anyway, Rex says, it's giving me big Last Witch Hunter energy. And Rango says, you know, I think Christmas Carol and Ghostbusters kind of had <laughs> the opposite messages. I kind of think so, too. Okay, so anyway, and in true terrible writing fashion, uh, he says, I, you know, I, 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 what does he say? He's, he gives this explanation that makes no sense. And Tiny Tim is just like, yo, okay, sure. That totally makes sense to me. And John Spider says, okay, Last Witch Hunter is good, actually, though. Wait, well, let me peek. Where are we going next? Okay, 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 okay. So, we've established. And <laughs> Froggy Man says, you said this part of the new James Gunn DCU? My God, it could be. All right, all right, all right, all right. It gets worse. I swear that it gets worse. So, so, so we, we have a stupid set of facts, but they all kind of work right now, right? 40 years past, even though they all look younger than that, Tiny Tim is in his 40s, Bob Cratchit's in his 70s, the nephew, Frederick, is probably in, like, his, his 50s or whatever, right? Rock says, you need a new tier where people can recommend you terrible comics to read and you do book reports on. And, and Scrooge lives forever, and that's why he can be 102 years old. And it all is dumb, but it works. But then, mm, then there's this scene where there's this ghost that starts possessing somebody. This is very close to the end of the whole book. And Fred, uh, you know, says to... To the ghost, he says, take me, you bastard. Spare him. Take me. And the ghost says, a noble gesture, Frederick, but I fear to inform you you're well into the twilight of your golden years. Last I checked, your watch and your heart stopped ticking at 51 food for the worms in scarcely eight more years, which means at the oldest, he's like, what does that make him, like 43 or 44? So was he four years old 40 years ago when a Christmas carol happened? What? He was, wasn't he like engaged in that book? Oh my god. Uh, Rocky friends, I absolutely adore this segment, by the way. You're so worked up. So so this is what I said. When I read this, I was like, because I've been do like, this is, this is like, linearly, this was my experience reading the book. It wasn't like I went back and put this all together afterwards. These were, uh, this, this problem of time, of chronology was on my mind the whole time. And so this doesn't make any sense. 
And, and Ringo says, wait, so I'm confused about one detail. So did he have the party and meet the fourth ghost the same day? So he had immortality, and then 40 years after, he started the ghost business? My understanding is he had the party. The party was 40 years later. And Wiseman says, precocious for a four-year-old. Well, it also means for him to be a... So I think he started the ghost business, like, right after A Christmas Carol. And then 40 years later is the party scene. And then the next day he's hungover. And then they find the second chain link, Okay. Um, it also means that he and Scrooge, if Scrooge is 102 years old and he's like 44, that means they're 58 years apart in age, which is like not unbelievable. It's not impossible for an uncle and a nephew to be 58 years apart, but it's a really big gap. And Giant Spadges is confused about one detail. So anyway, but the party can't be 40 years later though, because he's got immortality from the ghost. But I think he got immortality from the ghost the 40 years previous. Right, because he got immortality from the ghost on in the the during the events of a Christmas Carol, and then forty years later he looks the same age. Yeah, yeah, there you go in, in the Christmas Carol. So anyway, so so this is what I said about this. So this thing where he was going to be four years old and he's supposed to be only forty four. I just said the writer obviously didn't think about this, so I'm not going to think about it either. I said I'm just going to put it out of my head. We'll keep all our same head canon from before and just ignore that he's. We're just going to say he's in his fifties or whatever. Uh, or, or early 60s or something, because there's just no way, right? And so, so then I started thinking to myself, why? Why did we do this? Why? <laughs> what is the meaning of this? What is the purpose of having this 40-year time jump? Because it just seems to cause nothing but problems. And so it recognizes there's so many specific dates and ages in this comic. Broken Friend says there's a real May-December nibbling relationship. Uh, oh, nibbling? Oh, is a nibbling your niece or your nephew? Real May-December nibbling relationship. I don't quite know what that means, but I, I know what it means from context, but I'm just not familiar with the phrase. Anyway, I was trying to figure out why this could be. Why could this be? Why do we have this 40-year time jump? What purpose does it serve? And my first theory was this scene right here. So there's a scene where Ebenezer Scrooge tries to recruit the aid of a secret society of people who are kind of interested in paranormal stuff, sort of gentleman scientist, 18, you know, late 1800s type of guys. And this organization is made up of all these famous authors. So it's H.G. Wells and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and everything. And he, he goes to them and he's like, please help me out. And they're like, we, we're not going to help you out. We think you're stupid or whatever. And so he leaves, but one guy follows him out and is like, I don't think you're stupid at all. And Scrooge is like, that's so great. What's your name, by the way? And he says, Dickens, my dear Mr. Scrooge, Charles Dickens. And so I'm like, maybe this is why we have the 40-year time jump. It's so that he can meet Charles Dickens, and they become friends. And then later, towards the end of the book, we see Charles Dickens sitting down to start writing A Christmas Carol based on the events of the book. Rangwet says, wait, but doesn't he make the ghost hunting business after he meets the fourth ghost? But he meets the fourth ghost on the, the day after A Christmas Carol. Okay, so, so I was like, maybe that's what it is. But then I was thinking about it, and I was like... Oh, that's kind of weird, though. I guess I didn't know that Charles Dickens wrote A Christmas Carol as, like, a nostalgia piece. Like, I guess it was taking place 40 years before the time that he wrote it, and I just never knew that about it. But I looked it up, and no! Charles Dickens published A Christmas Carol in 1843, which was actually five years before they set the events of A Christmas Carol in this, in this comic! And so, it's not for Charles Dickens, and in fact, it means that Charles Dickens is writing A Christmas Carol like 45 years later. And so I went on Wikipedia, and I looked it up, and I was like, was Charles Dickens even alive in 1888? And no, he'd been dead for like a decade almost. And so, I think more than that. And, 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 so, so that means that now we have to live in a universe where it's an alternate universe story, and in this alternate universe... Charles Dickens lived and died like 45 years after he did in the real world, I guess. Giant Spider says, it will be okay, Piotr. It, it, it's, it's, it's terrible. And i just like, why, why are we doing this? And I, I figured it out, finally. I figured it out. And you're going to be relieved that there is a good reason. I said, what happened in 1888? And so there's this B plot going on the whole time. And Rogi Prince says, Adrian Gentile is going to receive his first deranged fan letter. And Ringwet says, he looked younger after he died, technically. And Rock says, no, he broke time when he broke that watch. Sam the Geek says, I've joined into Dickens. Sam, it's impossible to explain. Welcome. Um, so, so there's this B-plot going on the whole time. The reason this has to take place in 1888 is because Jack the Ripper is on the loose. And Jack the Ripper was in 1888. 
And so the B plot is he goes to the police for help and they're like, we're not going to help you. We've got our hands full. I'm sure you must be aware of these nasty Ripper murders. And so we're like, okay, so the whole reason that there's the time jump, the reason Charles Dickens is born like 45 years later than he was supposed to be born, the reason Scrooge has to be immortal, the reason for all of these things is that Ebenezer Scrooge can fight Jack the Ripper, can face off against him, right? And that seems pretty cool. And Sam the Geek says, Salty Mark says hi too. It's very curious about time tra- <laughs> It's very curious about time traveling through time to catch Jack the Ripper. Well, here's the thing about it. So it's all to set up this face off with Jack the Ripper, which is a real problem because it never happens. It doesn't happen in the book. He never fights Jack the Ripper. And so at the end of the book, literally the, the last page is this, this little tease with these, I guess these sex workers and they meet Jack the Ripper, we assume, and it's this character that we met before. And so we're like, okay, I get it. So the whole thing was to set up the sequel where he's going to fight Jack the Ripper, right? And that's why they had to have all this crazy time nonsense, doesn't make sense, characters' ages are all wrong. And John Spider says, okay, so you can mess with Dickens, but Jack the Ripper is a <laughs> saint? And uh, Sam the Geek says, wait, why is Jack the Ripper important? Because it would be cool. It would be cool if you fought Jack the Ripper. Sam Geek says, clear and present danger is a Tom Clancy novel about the drug wars. Well, so here's the worst thing, though. So we're setting up the sequel, and how the CIA interferes in Latin America and it always goes poorly. I have heard that it always went poorly. The worst thing is, when I told you that this was the last page of the book, I actually lied. Because uh, the actual last page of the book, and I swear to God this is true, is all the humbuggers arriving in New York. So it wasn't going to happen in the next book. It was setting up something to happen in a book that was going to be after the next book. And how that they thought there were ever going to be three of these, I cannot imagine. I just, that's the end of the presentation. This, this book, the hubris. They, 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 don't, they could have, there's so many things they could have done. They could have not had the time travel, not had Jack the Ripper at all. That would have fixed the problem. They could have moved Jack the Ripper back in time instead of moving Charles Dickens and making this crazy Ebenezer Scrooge has to live for everything. They could have moved the, the events of A Christmas Carol forward. And you know how I know they could have done that? Because they did. They moved the events of A Christmas Carol forward by like five years. So who cares? Why does it have to happen in 1848? Oh my God. Anyway. Jarek says, what do you think they were going to do in New York? Move into a firehouse. Oh, yeah. And the name of the boat? Titanic. Honestly, wouldn't be surprised. And the doctor says, I just joined. I have no idea what's happening, but I'm enjoying the tone of your presentation. We, we are doing a book report on the comic Humbug, which is true madness. And Sam McGeek says, but wouldn't it be very cool if they fought Jack? It would have been cool. They should have done it. Fight crime from a cave under the firehouse. And then Wiseman says, so A.J. Gentile really relies on things in the public domain creatively, huh? I guess so. So I did. <laughs> I, tried to, I tried to email the company that made this to, to try to learn more about the Trist. And all my emails bounced. But they did, <laughs> they did have a, um, a phone number <laughs> that I called. And I went through a phone tree and I left a message for A.J. Gentile. I don't think these, these, he's checking that answering machine anymore at this comic the, the the comic publisher has a website, but seems pretty defunct. I well, I'll let you know if we find out more, or if I find more AJ Gentile comics, or if somehow they get back in touch with me. I will let you know from there. But for now, all you need to know is humbug is madness. It broke my brain. It frustrated me the whole time. I went on a whole chronological journey. Oh, Arrakis says, Sherlock Holmes is also said in the 1880s, I think. So he can show up too. That's true. Uh, yeah, Con Arthur Conan Doyle is in this book also. Um, he's, he's there when they, before he meets Charles Dickens. Anyway, that's my report. Um, thank you for that. What are we doing? Are we playing a game? Okay. And Progy Friendly says, on Wisebird, watch out, poo. That's true. He did just enter the public domain, right? But you can't give him a red shirt, something like that. All right. Should we play some games, some computer games? Excellent report. Thank you.